Hey y'all, I'm Kelly Moody and you're listening to the Ground Shots Podcast, an audio project exploring our relationship to ecology through conversations and storytelling with farmers, herbalists, craftspeople, naturalists, artists, and more. Hey y'all, it's Kelly and you're listening to episode 5 of the Ground Shots Podcast. I'm currently sitting in my camper in Hood River, Oregon, just above town, where it's been raining all week, been kind of cool, definitely a welcome respite to a hot and dry summer in the West, doesn't rain very much at all, and it's been pretty nice to see the dust settle. I come to this area in Hood River, at least I have the past two years, to visit friends or house sit for friends. And last year when I was here, actually around the same time, there was a really intense fire that got started uh, by a teenager lighting off firecrackers. And then, you know, in the middle of summer, that just like completely engulfed the gorge, Columbia River Gorge, in flames. And I was in my friend's cabin and firefighters were showing up almost daily. It was pretty scary. I've never experienced anything like that before. Being from the East Coast, fire is not really something that we think about that much because everything's so humid and wet and rain happens kind of all the time. I mean, I know we have drought moments, but yeah, so being here right now, I really am reminiscing about that and like thinking about how things can be different from year to year and uh, one minute everything can be fine and dandy and the next minute there's a fire on your doorstep. So it's nice to see this land getting rain and soaking it in. This episode, uh, episode five, features an interview with the artist Ryan Pierce, who I uh, interviewed in Portland, Oregon. Just down the river from here a few weeks ago. He co-founded, along with activist Amy Harwood, the organization Signal Fire, based out of Portland, too, although they do their work all over the West. Signal Fire is an organization that facilitates a wide range of unique programming aimed at getting artists into wild spaces, and they they do this because they believe that artists can be powerful agents of change. I ended up doing one of Signal Fire's trips, the Wide Open Studios program that they do. This year they did it, uh, they are doing two of them, but last year they did one in the middle of the summer for about four weeks. We walked the traditional Nez Perce range, including areas of the Bitterroots in Montana and Idaho, the Wallawas in eastern Oregon, and actually just revisited that location where we walked this summer. And the experience doing this workshop or walking residency, there's a lot of different ways you can describe what Wyatt Open Studios is, was definitely a life-changing experience. In this conversation with Ryan, we talk about how Signal Fire started, how it has evolved over time, how it tackles issues of accessibility, and how it creates unique programming and the kinds of projects and initiatives it's involved in, which is quite a few different things, including a film festival and a lot of different programs. We talk about what uh, Signal Fire wants to do in the future, and I'm really excited about that because it's definitely something that alumni can get involved in. A lot of folks ask me about Signal Fire and what it's all about, and sometimes I kind of don't know exactly how to describe it 100%, so I feel like this conversation with Ryan is an opportunity to hear from one of the co-founders and guides firsthand uh, what Signal Fire is all about. Lastly, this podcast could definitely not be possible without the generous support of monthly subscribers on Patreon. 
I'm really grateful for the folks that have been supporting me thus far. Some folks have been there since the beginning. Some have come in and out. And I anything that people offer is just I'm so grateful for. Monthly subscribers get access to a whole slew of content related to our podcast, our writing projects, and a lot of other things. We also have tiers for supporting us on Patreon that include receiving packages like our land capsules, kind of a evolving art project for us that involves mixing writing, small batch medicine making, and often prints or different types of art. If you enjoy this podcast, consider supporting us on Patreon. It, it definitely gives us the financial ability to do this. Please do leave us feedback, too, on the podcast. Uh, we have a page on our website at obsessionsalt.com dedicated to the podcast, and you can comment there and leave any feedback. Also, leaving us a review on iTunes is super helpful in that way, too. We also have a Facebook page for Obsession Salt, and you can totally like us there and leave us feedback about the podcast there as well. Enjoy this conversation with Ryan Pierce. I co-founded Signal Fire with uh, Amy Harwood, and she's a public lands activist, and I'm an artist, a visual artist, and uh, and our intention in the founding was just to create some crossover between our communities and uh, convince activists that there were open-ended and um, creative tools that they could integrate into their campaigns and to offer artists time to be in wild places and fall in love with those places and create work in response to those places. Um, and so we signal fire. Our mission is to provide wilderness retreats and residencies on, on public lands. Um, in order to inspire resilience and um, and creative action for those artists. And so, how long ago was it? Did you start Signal Fire? I think this is our ninth year of programming, and it began just as an out of pocket art project. Mm -hmm. Amy got a little grant for her work as an activist, and we bought a. Um, travel trailer like a 70s travel trailer and a matte black 50s suburban nice and we re remodeled the trailer into a studio and, and the first residency was just like we would just tow people out to a logging road on mount hood and be like okay we'll be back in a week make some work wow so <laughs> it started with that as the idea of like having a mobile space mm -hmm. that is a studio space and taking it out there. Yeah, and we figured out pretty quickly that that was um, not very safe for the artists. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that also, it wasn't very fun for us because we would just like shop and then bring them food and drop them off and then go back to town and work our jobs. Um, and so it evolved. The next year we scrapped the trailer and got four big wall tents and started a nomadic residency called Outpost that moves around to different national forests and we can host four artists at a time. Um, as we record this, Outpost is up at Mount St. Helens National Monument, um, switching over between session one and session two. And so it's a week-long residency, totally self-directed, and artists can um, work in their tent during the day or take hikes or swim and then in the evening the guides will um, serve them dinner and everybody gets together and kind of hangs out for a couple hours um, and also that that second year we began um, offering backpacking trips and those backpacking and canoe trips and sort of like every kind of hybrid manner of camping became what we 
now group loosely under the term retreats. And that's, I would say, the main part of what we do in terms of our weeks of programming over the year. It's all different kinds of retreats for different, um, they're thematic and we offer them to different levels of makers um, from emerging artists all the way to pretty established ones. So the outpost has been the part of this work that has been the same throughout or like has been the, like an element throughout all the years. Yeah, it has. Um, we call it our flagship program. We don't offer it every year. It's pretty expensive for us and the tents are really heavy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we need... But we move it around to exciting places. One time we had it at the U.S.-Mexico border, mm. and we specifically invited artists to come respond to what it would be like to be in this wilderness area that was really militarized and, you know, super contested space. Wow. <clears throat> and so the, do you pick the locations according to current what's happening currently in our... I don't know, political climate around public lands or around the way that intersects social justice issues? And... Yeah, in a way. So Signal Fire has a different theme every year, and all the trips um, tack onto that somehow. And we have, I don't know, like 10 guides these days, volunteer guides, all made up of our alumni. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, and so the guides are increasingly like a collective, and and we meet together every fall and decide the theme for the next year. And then my role is the my job is called field coordinator now, um, and so I'm responsible for kind of like crafting the suite of trips that we're going to offer in conjunction with the theme and supporting the guides in in running those trips handling the application process and things like that. Um, and then we have two other staff at Signal Fire now. Um, Amy recently left staff and we um, hired Eden Redman and she's our development director. Um, and then we have Kayla Farrell-Smith who's been with us for I think three years now. And um, she is our community coordinator. Cool. Yeah. So you... <clears throat> founded it with Amy and then now both of you have kind of taken a little bit of a less major role in organizing mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Now we have, we have a model of three co-directors, so it's a non-hierarchical staff model. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of specialize in different areas. Me, me on the backcountry trips, Kaila on the community programs, like exhibitions and events that feature our alumni's work or um, other work we're interested in promoting. Um, and then Eden raises the money and <laughs> keeps us organized and accountable. Were you saying earlier, keeps it so that you're not writing your numbers down on cardboard? Yeah. And putting it under your <laughs> yeah. bed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, um, I, it's interesting you were telling me about it last uh, summer because it's based out of Portland, Signal Fire, but then it's all over. How that's sort of unique and interesting that, and you all get grants because you're nonprofit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, we we went from like art projects to nonprofit about um, five years into the project. So we really did that step slowly and intentionally. I think sometimes people will start an organization and just be like, "Oh, we'll be a nonprofit," but Amy had been working for nonprofits professionally and she was loath to just like jump into more admin work without really having a reason to do it so we waited until we were ready to like really grow and bring in other leadership we have a really involved board of directors as well so we have kind of this like um concentric circle model where we have maybe the staff in the middle and the guides around that and the board of directors around the whole thing, keeping us accountable and offering us guidance. That's an interesting model. I mean, I don't know a lot about how nonprofits function, but it, but yeah, it seems like each one might be kind of different, but how it can easily become hierarchical as well. Like who has the money and the power and 
the agenda is kind of about who has the money or I mean I know that that's still hard to escape with anything where your whole uh, program still depends on like donations or fin- a financial aspect mm-hmm. you know? well I think like the the template that not, you know nonprofit corporations are modeled to be set up the same way that for-profit corporations are mm-hmm. you know with some minor differences and so you know amy and i have been pretty critical of the corporate model um throughout the founding process and tried to instill our values and our um, workarounds in that whenever possible what before it was a nonprofit, it was just didn't have any official anything it's just we were just an art project that yeah so like if i would sell a painting or Amy would get a grant, that was our budget. Oh. <laughs> and when, when we got vacation time, we would have a residency, mm-hmm. like had a little website and people from all over would apply. Um, and now, nine years later, I think we've had, you know, after this year, we will have had probably 400 people involved. Like different artists mm-hmm. who've done residencies or wide open studios. Or... Right, yeah. How do you feel like people find Signal Fire? I, I, like I was telling you earlier, I feel like I hear people say, "Oh, I've heard of that." I mean, how do I mean, how did you find us? Um, you asked me that last summer. The Piney Wood Atlas oh, folks. Yeah. That these I don't know if one of the two people involved in that like did a residency or a project with Signal Fire, or they just they do these zines where they go around and find cool residencies and like put it together in a book and i saw it i was like this sounds perfect for me (laughs) yeah so i think yeah just word of mouth is mainly how people find us we have you know we're on a few residency databases but we typically don't pay for listings you have to pay to be on a database some of them yeah i mean Mm -hmm. there's there's organizations that list residencies that sustain themselves by having the listees pay a certain amount, um, and we've been we've been re- pretty successful at um, getting quality applications without doing that. And we've also found that um, so one thing that's kind of special about our application process is that we don't ask people for their CVs um, or artist resumes, and so we get a really good mix of people who are self taught as well as people who are you know, emerging and, and really also people who are really accomplished in their field. Um, and we find it increases the value of our, of our programs for everybody to have like a nice mix of people from different backgrounds and different career levels mm-hmm. all, all in it together. Um, and then w- within that, we have programs called Wide Open Studios that are um, more curriculum forward and Main, you know, mainly we sort of like target emerging artists and current students in that populace, but it's certainly not restricted to that. It's just kind of like more of a school or a workshop model. And then we have on the other end our juried programs, which are more self-directed. Um, so we try to offer like a way to connect for just about anybody. Um, how many years have you been doing Wide Open Studios and like how did that start? Um, yeah, this is our sixth year of Wide Open Studios. It started because I have always wanted to do it <laughs> since I was yeah. like 19. Um, I, when I was in college, I did this backpacking, um, like semester backpacking called Sierra Institute. Um, and it was an environmental field studies program. And we took classes outside and read books and hiked around Utah. And it was just like totally life changing for me. And I've always wanted to recreate some kind of model like that um, as an art school, like a wilderness art school. And so I, I've been teaching off and on in higher education for the last 10 years since I came out of grad school. And, and universities. Mm-hmm, at different universities, most recently at Lewis and Clark College here in Portland. Um, and so wide open studios we offer 
we offer those programs um, as like week long workshops, but also as month long trips like you've done with us. Um, and those are offered for credit through our various academic partners. Cool. Yeah. And you are not currently teaching at a university, right? I'm retired now. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm, you were saying that it was kind of hard to do that full time, but yeah, I like with the amount of trip leadership I do with Signal Fire, it's really hard to abide by an academic calendar. Um, so we typically run trips in the Southwest in the spring and now in the fall as well. Um, and then in the summer, we're up here in the Northwest. You were saying that you, because you don't uh, ask for a CV, which I didn't even know what that was <laughs> until last year. So for me, it actually felt less intimidating to apply because I don't have like formal art school type mm -hmm. training. And so it doesn't define artists by that. Um, but so I, I like that aspect of your application process, mm -hmm. but also you still ask for like samples of work, right? Mm -hmm. you do? You ask for yeah, we ask work? for some kind of portfolio, but we, we leave that really broad because we want to be able to attract folks who are like maybe more in the activist world mm -hmm. and um, don't really promote themselves as artists. I don't know. I think you're a really good example of somebody who's like... Um, like the kind of person that we want to attract and and who may not apply to like the McDowell colony or some other like mm -hmm. more established residency. Uh, we want to find people who are serious about their inquiry in the natural world and who would be um, supported by our programs and interested in like um, developing their craft outside. Um, but that maybe are not always like on the conventional artist track. Yeah, because, and what I really appreciate about what Signal Fire is doing too is also that a lot of artists feel confined to cities where they can't engage and they're like in a building with no windows or something. And mm -hmm. this is where you have to be if you're an artist. And I feel like that's pretty limiting to the creative process engaging the land or wild spaces or, you know, nature or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it. But. Yeah, and we get a whole mix. We get, you know, artists who have experience with rural living or who are like in the backcountry all the time. And they're kind of like, you know, I've been doing this my whole life and you're my people. And then hmm. we get, you know, high strung New Yorkers who are like, my family thinks I'm going to die. You know, my <laughs> friends think I'm crazy. Seven days without a shower. Um, and. You know, I love converting those people <laughs> <laughs> into outdoorsy yeah. artists. Yeah. Do you feel like you've seen some people really transform in that way who have never really done anything like a backpacking trip? Before? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, we we've had people say, you know, in a positive way, "Oh, you ruined me." You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, you know, and and a big part a big part of our evolution has been following up with our alumni and trying to get people back for a second or third or even fourth trip mm -hmm. um, because every trip is so different and thematically different and structurally different and different landscape and different weather um, and um, trying to get our alumni to integrate backcountry travel into their practice if possible and just kind of like keep some dialogue with the natural world alive in their work afterwards. Yeah, I know that everyone I did the trip with is like, can we just do this all the time? <laughs> <laughs> and then you go back to real life and you're like, okay. I mean, for me, it's a little bit different because I kind of already was doing this on my own, mm -hmm. literally camping out or like being out there and doing stuff creatively. But then to then join a group of people doing it in more of a structured way with like professors or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, y'all don't really call yourselves that <laughs> out there, but... Um, and like a, commu a, a community of support in a container was nice, but then going back out, it kind of changed my relationship to like doing projects, mm. I think. But I know for a lot of folks, it's like they have a whole other world that they're accountable to that's like paying rent and a job or they're doing their MFA or, you know, and. Right. So like coming on Signal Fire can be a completely 
binary experience where like you have to turn all that stuff off and disengage and for a lot of our a lot of our um, artists who are like pretty married to a urban life signal fire is a model that they can kind of like turn on as a as a resource for um, creative regeneration or vacation um, or just to like instigate some new ideas in their work and then for other folks like you who have a more fluid lifestyle and spend a lot of time outdoors and can can integrate that into their practice um, I think it's like a less binary uh, experience mm -hmm. I feel like y'all do a good job of sort of getting all kinds of different people from different cultures or you do a good job with inclusivity and I know that's kind of a tricky thing to navigate mm -hmm. uh, without being tokenizing or without like, you know, targeting certain groups of people to make sure you're not just a bunch of white, like middle class artists. So like, do you have any thoughts on how y'all think about that? And like, yeah, yeah. A lot of, a lot of thoughts about that. I would say that building a diverse community has been the most challenging um, and and um, the area that I've had the greatest amount to learn in doing this. So Amy and I are both white, and um, I think that the outdoor, like the mainstream outdoor recreation, or at least the way it's portrayed in popular culture is a pretty white world. And the art world obviously has a lot of uh, privilege and money associated with it. So that crossover is a really exclusive and often exclusionary space. Um, and the way that I think the way that I initially approached trying to bring diversity to our organization was maybe like less informed or authentic than it could be. And, um, Kaila's native, she's Klamath and Modoc, and she's brought a lot of, um, her activism on behalf of Native communities and interest in um, acknowledging the Native presence in the lands that we're using. She's brought a lot of that into our organization and our mission and our work in a way that's been um, just really impactful for the way that we're all working and for the kind of scope of things that we can offer. Um, so for example, she led a trip this year that was all um, indigenous artists um, as part of a, they were part of a mentorship program um, working in traditional skills, contemporary artists, but working in traditional skills with um, more established native artists. And so all these mentees came together and Kayula took them camping for a few days and then brought them to a more established residency in Central Oregon that's named Caldera. Mm -hmm. um, and they had like a week in the studios there to respond to the signal fire experience making work. Um, and so, yeah, I think that um, my thinking around like diversifying our community, we still have a long ways to go, um, but has evolved to acknowledge that like we need to make our the work we're doing really relevant to those communities if we're going to bring them in in a way that's not tokenizing um and so really changing it from the inside out and diversifying our leadership and our board and um you know those of us who are white just doing a lot more listening and asking than um than before and then, then telling other people what to do. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. It, yeah. Like what you said earlier, both of y'all have like, but you and Amy who founded it have not, are not necessarily in the most leadership. I mean, you still end up having to do things just because you know what the details are, mm -hmm. but it's kind of slowly stepping down from that and like letting other people kind of run things and decide things. And yeah, it's been a huge lesson in collaboration for me because 
I always like my ideas the best at first. <laughs> <laughs> and then when then when I um check that mm -hmm. when I check that inclination for a little bit and do some more listening, I I usually um am exposed to a better way to do it. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about because what you were just saying about integrating this activism element more into your programs? I just felt like Wide Open Studios. I mean, it was more than what I even expected. Like I didn't even quite realize how much it would be until we were in there. But mm -hmm. the um, yeah, like your goal with it because you integrate story and I mean and I know my trip might be completely different than what a different year would be but obviously the story of what happened to the native folks whose land that we're on and it's a really important aspect of that and mm -hmm. not something you really see in the outdoors community or necessarily I mean a lot, I mean it's just a unique blend of those things and mm -hmm. so yeah we maybe you could speak on that I don't know yeah I mean so some of the things that we try to integrate into every trip are like contextualizing the place we're going by learning about which indigenous people live there um, and where those communities are currently if they were displaced from that land um, and you know usually if possible we we try to intersect with the native communities that are adjoining the public lands because most most of the national forest and BLM land um, you know, was once occupied by Native people and they were shoved off sometimes to just like a neighboring parcel, which is usually reservation land or sometimes like pretty far away. Um, so we try to sh share those stories and talk to those people when possible um, and let them tell their own stories. Um, and then I think that there's another element that we try to weave into all of our programs that is like... Um, kind of rewriting or offering different narratives about like who has access to public lands and what the face of environmentalism can and, and maybe should be uh, and make that, you know, work towards making that a more inclusive space. And so we do a lot of like, like we don't really tend to read a lot of John Muir um, or some of the kind of Edward Abbey. Edward Abbey, yeah. <laughs> oh. We don't really read the like canonical texts very much. Um, we try to kind of like mine that stuff out and look at um, different voices that are critical of um, mainstream white environmentalism and that can tell us different stories about who has ties to the land and cares for it um, as a way of... of debunking some of those founding myths and, um, you know, working towards a environmental movement that is shared by everybody. So much to say about all of that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate y'all make readers. That's, and I mean, it seems like it's a lot of work too. Like each week that we are out there, you have a different like reader that you put together and, mm -hmm. It's not just, I mean, maybe you, you obviously have some sort of agenda with it all, but I like that if there's so many different types of things thrown in there mm -hmm. and um, not just all one perspective. And that really opened my eyes to seeing environmentalism in a different way, I think. I mean, I think about that stuff anyways, but then like now I go into a library or like a bookstore and I'm looking at someone, a poetry book about the Sierra's environmental writer, and it's all white men. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I guess I knew that before, but I just think about it even more now. And yeah. Yeah, that's good to hear. I think, um, you know, what I approach when I'm, the way I approach a reader these days is like really trying to look at every reading as like a potential lens onto the landscape and the experience. And I love, like when I'm backpacking by myself, I just like hike a few miles and then sit down and read for like six hours. <laughs> That's like really my ideal um, outdoor experience. And so, um, you know, as, as you probably remember, the readers are like pretty ambitious. It's like 50 or 70 pages of new reading every day. And 
you know, five or six different pieces that might be like um, personal essay and, and fiction and poetry and um, critical writing and stuff like that, science writing sometimes, um, just like looking at different ecological and cultural histories of wherever we are and also kind of like broader debatable things like eco-philosophy and mm -hmm. environmental ethics and a lot of stuff about like land justice and environmental justice. Um, do you, I, it seems to me that like you probably spend a lot of time putting those together. If, I mean, like that's takes a lot of reading to figure out what you want other people to read. <laughs> and like, yes. And when I do have a college job, I'm like the library criminal, like the guy with 70 books checked out. And oh, right. Like, if, like rock in the inner library loan. I was joking uh, this year when I was teaching at Lewis and Clark, I was joking with the librarian that I was trying to get all the books from all the other libraries <laughs> so, so that they wouldn't have any huh. just by uh, abusing the interlibrary loan system. I was thinking about it. I was like, does Ryan just have like all of these books in his own personal library that he's just like in his bedroom with all of them everywhere and he's just like, <laughs> I'm, you know, but I forget that, right. There's a li there's public libraries, or if you're working for universities, sometimes. Yeah. No, my bedroom much... looks like what you're imagining. There's <laughs> just like a barricade, well, especially when I'm working on readers, yeah. like just a fence of books around my bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's fun. It's, I love it. Yeah. I got like curating what, and you kind of can project what kind of things you're going to end up talking about or how it might influence people's projects. I mean, I can't even imagine. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it must be. Fun. And then another element um, is the visiting presenters that we bring mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I don't know, thinking back to your trip, we had, like, a storyteller when we were on the Nez Perce Reservation. Um, we had a wolf biologist. That was cool, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just kind of, like, bringing in different voices. I think that, that has a big impact on the trip each time as well this this year on the long trip we had a couple of botanists including a conifer specialist oh. yeah man that's awesome <laughs> and, uh, and we stopped at the hoopa reservation and talked to a really awesome uh native artist named Brittany britain who mm -hmm. came and got an mfa in portland and then moved right back to the reservation where she grew up and um you know has a huge garden and lives a a rural lifestyle but still makes like really edgy and important contemporary art mm -hmm. yeah. does that person then come to the city to do shows or like in, in, engaged in like a mo in like the art world whatever that means yeah she drives into eureka and arcata for teaching and for showing um, but she lives with her partner you know, two hours away in Hoopa mm -hmm. with her family. Um, so you do the Outpost, which is a residency that is usually about a week or two mm -hmm. long, and then the Wide Open Studios, and then, which is about a month most mm -hmm. of the time, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have other sort of programs that are both in Portland and other places. Right. And maybe can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so within the within our kind of like constellation of backcountry trips we have outpost super self-directed one week long um, we have our retreats which might be backpacking or canoeing or some combination of car camping with little backpacks um, and those are generally a week long we have wide open studios which might be a week long or a month long and then we have um day hikes which are called reading in place it's like a sort of just a one day sample of a signal fire trip and those are usually based around portland and we'll have a guest artist come and um, select a reading and we send a pdf out to everybody who wants to come and just um take a tiny hike and have a picnic and a discussion and come back to town by evening um, so that's like a really easy way to interface with Signal Fire and kind of try it out, see what we're up to. Um, then we have a program called Tinderbox in which we sponsor an artist to work 
on staff with an environmental organization mm -hmm. for three months and give them a stipend and they get a desk inside the organization and they are invited to make work in response to um, the campaigns of the environmental organization. So most recently we sponsored um, a composer named Holcomb Waller to work with Columbia Riverkeeper and mm -hmm. he made this um, suite of songs and a performance uh, based on what what's happening with uh, coal export along the Columbia River. Wow. Yeah, pretty cool. And that organization then can integrate that art or music in their work too. Yeah, exactly, way. yeah. And so usually when we, when we approach an environmental organization about that, they may or may not be receptive to the vision and, mm -hmm. and they generally want like pretty clear outcomes and say like, oh, you know, like this artist could redesign our brochures and stuff like that and and that's really not what we have in mind what we want is for them to give the artist space and access to the knowledge of their staff and to let the artist respond in the way that they want um, and to keep in mind the, that they may not be able to foresee um, the exciting outcomes yet um, you know because if folks have not worked with artists they May not, may not be used to the kind of like open-ended, uh, non-linear thinking that some artists employ in their mm -hmm. work. Um, and then artists, on the flip side, can gain a lot from working with an environmental organization that has like very clear outcomes and measurable effects and really think about that kind of accountability in their own work. I think. Mm -hmm. Having a little more of a specific agenda or container mm -hmm. that something there's a need that could be filled and you can do this right thing right and then we have um exhibits and a uh, publication called leaf litter and um other ways of highlighting our alumni's work parties performances mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. i think that's cool that y'all do that i mean you don't just like have people come in and then you never see them again. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe some folks, obviously, you don't never see again. But Yeah, we have a big show next month at PNCA, the Art College in Portland, um, featuring eight of our artists from uh, the year called Unwalking the West. And then we have like a film festival this fall oh, cool. um, associated with that exhibition. And then, as you know, like at any given time, we have tons of alumni who are showing their work like your colleague Tilka Elkins has a show up right now at PCC and yeah, and She's on and on. said she got that show because there was a Signal Fire alumni show there and someone approached her mm. about if she would like to apply, she should. Oh, and cool. So she was, I guess because there was one last year there. And so because of that, she then applied and then got in and then created this work and so came around in that way too, like finding that because of signal fire so that's cool to hear yeah we're i think we're big enough now that we're not even always aware when people are making connections through our community and that's great that's mm -hmm. really nice to hear cool yeah that film festival what did someone um is that something you do every year or regularly or is that because there was a particular thing that you did that year that made that possible um With so the film event is kind of a long answer. So Kaila, uh, when she came to Signal Fire, she had just organized um, an all-native film festival. Um, and I'm totally spacing on the name of it. One Flaming Arrow. Okay. Yeah. And um, it was really fantastic. At that point, it was uh, film and visual art, both at multiple venues throughout Portland. And she was a Signal Fire alumni already at that point, and we were looking for somebody to, to help us out. Um, so she came on staff, she continued organizing One Flaming Arrow, and it sort of changed to just a film festival. And then we partnered with them to offer um, a film event uh, last year that was in conjunction with our theme called Unwalking the West. So we had a year where we styled all of our trips after famous routes of 
you know, awful European explorers. And we, we did those routes. We did segments of those routes backwards and huh. talked about the impact of settlement and conquest and those founding myths. And we talked to a lot of native communities about their views of those um, explorers. That Lewis and Clark were such great people. Right. Yeah. So we did like a, <laughs> we did a month long trip called Unwalking Lewis and Clark and, um, followed their route from Cape Disappointment all the way to the upper Missouri and, uh, trips like that. And so we, we have, uh, the exhibition that's at PNCA and the film festival related to it are both around that theme. We typically like wait a couple of years to see what sort of work happens in response to the trips. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're just now highlighting those eight artists from those, uh, 2016 trips here in 2018 who have made things since then that uh are compelling right exactly and that that thematically are linked to that unwalking idea are you gonna do do you ever repeat uh themes like or plan to because i'm like i want to do that (laughs) one because i've been thinking about that over the years a lot and what i've been doing and oh yeah we haven't yet repeated a theme and there's just so much we want to do next year is going to be um, about migration and mm-hmm. we're going to be doing several trips by the US Mexico border mm-hmm. um, talking about animal migration talking about plant communities migrating due to climate change mm-hmm. and then of course talking about human migration um, especially in this super fraught xenophobic political climate um, and yeah the, like I said the guides um, really contribute towards thinking about the themes and then we kind of we have five regions in the West that we've identified as places that we want to return to and build relationships in. Um, and so we match up trips in those regions. And then sometimes we do kind of like one-offs where we go somewhere that is not one of those places. Like we did a wolf reintroduction trip in the Boundary Waters in Minnesota one time. And then last year, Last year, Amy led a canoe trip on the Rio Grande that was like half U.S. artists and half Mexican artists, and they were floating the border together. Wow. Um, So things like that. That's something else I just, for people who don't know, Signal Fire is based mainly in the west of the so-called United States. Mm -hmm. Because I know there's a lot of people out east to where I'm from they're like we need something like this out here but it's just it's a different dynamic and like I know that y'all can't necessarily spread yourselves but so far and you're all based out here but I think like every year for the last four years we've had a east coast trip on the first draft of the budget and then when we're tightening the belt (laughs) it always slips away it's just it's just far for us to get out and our knowledge of public lands in the east and like you know, it's trickier to find like really big roadless areas out there. Um, And so we'll get there. The more that we go to the same places and cultivate our partnerships there Mm -hmm. with, you know, local tribal communities and environmental groups, it just makes those trips that much of a richer experience. Um, Our guides live all over. Um, But, you know, I think the way that we started signal fire there was like a pretty touristic aspect to the way we chose the trips because amy Mm -hmm. and i would do them on our vacations and we'd be like where do you want to go you know Mm -hmm. um but as it's evolved we've tried to commit more and more to like um investing in the communities you know that adjoin the places where we're going and like you've said before what's relevant to what where where do we need to put people or where, where do we need to engage right now to you mm-hmm. know based on all these different factors yeah exactly yeah i mean i think like i don't know the the border capital b border has become this like m- mythical place and that you have all these people talking about it politically and like fears around it and these ideas that like like, I don't know what people are imagining, but they most people have not been down there and seen, you know, really, like, gotten to know the desert and seen this, like, really harsh and beautiful region that, like, people 
some people walk through out of total desperation for a better life and many people die crossing it. And, you know, when we did outpost at the border, it was this confluence of like, you know, at night in absolute silence, people moving through the canyons around us, making their way north. And then, um, border patrol helicopters converging on us all the time and border patrol agents on motorcycles and in jeeps just like zooming through what what should be a roadless area should be a motorless place but they have the authority to ignore all environmental rules within 100 miles of the border really yeah so they can just drive their jeeps through the you know so-called wilderness um to try to catch some right to try to catch person you know yeah somebody on foot and then and then ranchers you know cattle everywhere and um ranchers also in jeeps like driving around shooting coyotes um it's a really complex place and it's also i mean just like on an ecological level the sonoran desert is um one of the most biotically interesting and um, beautiful places I've ever been. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has spent time down there, Erin, who you maybe met briefly. She dropped me off Mm -hmm. that day when I met everyone. Mm -hmm. She's spent the past like four or five winters camped with friends down there to do, she does primitive pottery and just they're there and her partner does primitive blacksmithing and they just do their thing there, you know, and she's done some stuff with that organization. What's it called? No More Deaths. No More Deaths, yeah. A little bit. and So we're hoping to offer an alumni trip next year. Let me just plant a seed for you. <laughs> uh, where our alumni come and do some like desert backcountry skill building. And then a week of volunteering with No More Deaths. And training on how to provide migrant aid down there. And I know that's tricky right now. I mean, I know that organization and things like that have been around for a while. But... Mm-hmm. It's become a little more like it's criminalized now to actually aid someone. Right. It's crazy crossing the border, like just giving them water or leaving water you can get arrested for. Right. Yeah. The Border Patrol is arresting people for offering aid to dying migrants. They're like just, they're out of control. It's, they're awful. Mm -hmm. Something that's come in my mind a few times since we've been talking about this today, like activism can look a lot of different ways. And I appreciate how it, in this case, like making art or like using art as a way to respond to things that are happening, which sometimes isn't so intellectual. I mean, I know that the readers are kind of intellectual and like our talks are intellectual, but just something that's more emotional or visceral. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like, I mean, and also people are so performative about their a- activism right now, like on Instagram, make sure you have, to, you have to speak about everything every time it happens, but then it's, that's it, right. you know? So I think both the act of what can you physically do, but also like the art making and the way that plants visions and seeds mm-hmm. in the world that like make people think a little bit differently about things. I think that's also really important activism that I think is often ignored. I do too. And I think that like, as artists, we have license to make very non-didactic, open-ended, poetic, strange gestures in the world that may be motivated by activism or political impulse, but that may not have like a directly applicable use. And I, I really believe in like keeping room for that. And I think a lot of what we're doing on our trips is sort of like feeding artists with like a lot of really specific information and then also like the experience itself and that that all kind of like goes in the hopper and comes out as something completely different but then i think in addition to that like as people we have a responsibility to make measurable actions on you know in support of the things we believe in Hmm. Yeah. Um, do you have any new or any, I mean, anything that you feel like five years from now, what would you imagine Signifier is doing? And <laughs> unless it's secret, but 
I mean, who knows what our whole world would be like. I mean, it's just the times are in are really intense, so. Yeah, no, I, I have um, modest ambitions. I mean, Signal Fire is, it's a great size right now. Mm -hmm. We're like building our uh, organizational capacity so that the jobs, like the staff jobs are sustainable. You know, Amy and I just kind of like worked for free or really, really cheap for many years. And that's not a good long-term plan. So mm -hmm. we're, like you said, uh, we're kind of like shifting away from the core leadership and bringing in new voices um, and, you know, letting them guide the work and make it more relevant in terms of like, my own involvement, I want to stay working on Wide Open Studios and really, you know, I do, I do a lot of like critical thinking about our institutions and higher mm -hmm. education. And I think in so many ways, that's like a extremely expensive and disappointing experience for some people and that it doesn't, um, doesn't really reflect the values I want to see in the art world. And so Wide Open Studios is going to start offering a certificate track next year in which people can like spend two years doing trips with us That's and awesome. working with uh, mentors in the signal fire community um, so that they're making work you know in a way that like um, well is a fraction of the cost of grad school but um, has like a similar intensity as a low residency mfa program mm -hmm. and that also includes this leadership track where they're coming on trips and building their backcountry skills and um, in dialogue with with Signal Fire and the places that we're going. So it wouldn't be an MFA that you're offering, but some sort of college credit certificate you thing, maybe? Or... Yeah, I, the, the degree itself will just be something we invent. You know, you just like it's recognition that you've done this program with mm -hmm. us. But um, just like it is now, students can can have an academic partner yeah. where they essentially can buy credit um, for for the experience. I'd like to offer sea kayaking trips. Oh, cool! In the next few years. What? Where? Baja. Yeah, my same friend Aaron, the Sonoran Desert person, did that once with a bunch of people who are really into survival trips or whatever. They uh -huh. did the, and she almost drowned in a storm. Where she flipped over and no one was around. But <laughs> okay, yeah. So I need to like <laughs> take some swimming lessons first. But, yeah. Uh, but she said it was amazing, and yeah, there's details like where to get fresh water and all these things. But mm -hmm. that sounds amazing. Like to, not on the land, but on the water. And yeah, I mean, one of the big challenges towards um, accessing our programs is like physical ability and mm -hmm. so outpost doesn't involve hiking we've been able to connect to some people that way but i think also like a lot of folks will come on a boat trip who would not come on a backpacking trip and we really want to like be cognizant of making ourselves as accessible as possible um, to different bodies and different backgrounds and experiences mm -hmm. so that's a that's an ongoing challenge for us and also a lot of these programs cost money, which mm -hmm. I know when I've talked about it with some of my friends who really don't have access to like what, I mean, it depends on what you're doing too with mm -hmm. your program, but um, I guess you offer scholarships and things like that too, to mm -hmm. mediate that for certain people. Yeah. And I'm really excited that next year we're reaching a big milestone, which is that all of our um, jury trips will be free. Um, so that up till... At the beginning, it was sort of like a few hundred dollars to come, and mm -hmm. because we weren't we weren't a nonprofit, so we couldn't really fundraise so much. Um, but now we offset all of the administrative costs of the trips, and artists can pay on a sliding scale. Um, the wide open studios trips are more of our earned income, kind of mm -hmm. like workshop side of things. We still fundraise all the admin costs for those. But artists pay their way in terms of like fuel and food and, um, you know, and then if they're paying for college credit, they have to pay a, a different Extra fee. organization. Yeah, we have no kind of no control over how much that costs. Um, 
But yeah, I think one of the coolest outcomes of becoming a nonprofit is that we've really been able to offset the fees. And so if, if people are like, even compare us to other outdoor nonprofits, like Knowles or Outward Bound, we're about a fourth or a third of the cost and we eat way better food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And do so many other cool things. Yeah. We got readers and <laughs> cool van. And mm -hmm. What's the van's name again? Snow Baby. Snow Baby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hmm. Well, that's really exciting. The idea of your um, two-year thing sounds intriguing to me, personally, too. Yeah, so. yeah. Good. Uh, I mean, your name comes up a lot as like somebody who's on a like a pretty serious educational track that is informed by your own interests and not by just what's out there. Um, and we're like, how do we? Like, how do we make ourselves relevant to more people like you? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and I have a lot of friends that are kind of similar to me in that way of, well, I guess I am my own person. But, you know, <laughs> people who also are really just not into higher education, mm -hmm. but also have a lot of things that they're doing that no one sees or they don't really know how to communicate it to the world because it feels like the only way to do that is, like, in a gallery or going to get an MFA where you spend like your whole life paying back. And, mm -hmm. and I know for me, I try to see into all those worlds and like understand what things that can be really good about that too. Mm -hmm. Um, and not just writing it off totally, but also seeing how it does feel. Yeah. And I've seen the other side of it. A lot of people doing really cool things that that's just, it's completely out of their realm, you know, mm -hmm. and that y'all are kind of in between in that way. Like, you're also dip into that but yeah and i think that like speaking for myself and then also knowing like some of the experiences of our guides like a lot of us have gone the mfa route and i have like a relatively conventional side to my art practice where i show in galleries and museums mm -hmm. and i feel like i can take the parts of that that i like translate them to the signal fire experience um and, and then leave aside the parts that are just like capitalist garbage and, um, you know, like endless administrative fees that just like go to inflate these universities and, and programs that, um, you know, because we're light on our feet and we're a small organization, we can like just trim it down to what I feel like is really actually necessary. Mm -hmm. While still offering a really quality cool experience that is meaningful you know yeah and ambitious and and like very intense i mean as you remember on the wide open studios trips we're like sometimes we're engaged all day and we're around each other all the time it's like lots of discussion lots of physical activity lots and lots of reading and and making and they're like very full days so or sleeping in a tent with somebody you barely know or having yeah. to deal with food. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Who's gonna get an apple every day? And who's gonna have the ramen every day, you know? <laughs> I don't think ever anybody's ever come out of our month long trip and said like, Well that was really easy. Yeah. You know, it's like it's demanding on it, it may not be like physically demanding on a hiking level mm -hmm. compared to some other programs, but um it's demanding in some way for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, challenging enough, but then not so challenging that you like break down from it. Like maybe a Knoll's trip is meant to be like pushing your edge mm -hmm. and your ability to, to go far and wide and hard, you know? Right. Is there anything else you want to share before we wrap up about all of this? Oh, I could talk forever, but I <laughs> encourage people to check us out and thanks for the opportunity to. Yeah to talk about it and i got to sit down and ask you anything i wanted <laughs> <laughs> um where can people find stuff about signal fire and the ethers of our world of digital and yeah start at, and... start at our website which is signalfirearts.org plural arts um and we're on instagram at artists are intense cool well, thanks for sitting down and chatting a little bit about all of this, and it's got me excited. My pleasure. Thinking about the future, what yeah. you're doing, and yeah. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
You just listened to episode five of the Ground Shots podcast, a conversation with Ryan Pierce, artist and co-founder of Signal Fire. To get involved with Signal Fire, do any of their programs, donate to their organization. The link to their website that Ryan mentioned in the interview can be found in our show notes. I'm excited that we have reached episode five of the Ground Shots podcast and look forward to sharing with you a bunch of the interviews and conversations I've had this summer with artists, hikers, activists, crafts folks, um, farmers, herbalists, a lot of different kinds of people. And I know that every episode seems pretty different, but yet I think I'm aiming to feature different voices of folks who work with advocating for the land or work with the land or have different ideas about the land or how we're engaging all of these things that come up around that and this right now in the world that we live in. So thanks so much for listening and until next time. This episode of the Ground Shots podcast was produced by Opia Creative. Our music is by Mother Marrow. If you'd like to help us continue to make this audio project a reality, consider becoming a monthly supporter on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash obsessionsalt, where we have rewards like entry into patron-only giveaways, additional audio interviews, extra educational content, and much more. You can also share our work and give us a review on iTunes. Visit our website at obsessionsalt.com to see what else we're up to and a log of our episodes when they come out. Check out our show notes for information about how to find us and our guests. Until next time, y'all. Thanks for listening.